A nation constituted in conflict with its own ideals would need to be reconstructed before it could be fully constructed. It would need to go to war with itself and win, then reconstruct itself differently. This is not rebuilding, but reconstructing to the core of governance, citizenship, history, infrastructure, and the distribution of land. Paradoxically, the people who did the constructing and must now do the reconstructing are likely to be the same. Laborers in one instance and authors in another. Designers of this nation and of themselves. And of themselves. The Black Reconstruction Collective commits itself to continuing this work of reconstruction in Black America and these United States. We take up the question of what architecture can be, not a tool for imperialism and subjugation, not a means for aggrandizing the self, but a vehicle for liberation and joy. The discipline of architecture has consistently and deliberately avoided participation in this endeavor, operating in complicity with repressive aspects of the current system. That ends now. We commit ourselves to annihilating the willful blinders that have enabled architecture to continue to profess its Eurocentrism as a virtue and claim apolitical ends. We reject the boundaries established by nation states. We reject the boundaries established by nation states, challenge the spatial manifestations of anti-black racism, and encourage creative agency and liberatory practices. This collective portal unites activists, scholars, architects, artists, and organizers across time and space. With this commitment to black freedom and futurity, we dedicate ourselves to doing the work of designing another world that is possible here, where we are, with and for us. It is an honor uh, to welcome the Black Reconstruction Collective to Georgia Tech. Um, I'm Scott Marble. I'm the chair of the School of Architecture, and I want to welcome everyone to what will be an engaging discussion between the BRC members and our students. Um, the BRC came together around a current exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art uh, in New York City entitled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America organized and curated by Sean Anderson and Mabel Wilson. However, the intent of the BRC, in my understanding, goes well beyond the show to that of a sustained and longer goal of supporting black artists and architects to collectively imagine transformations to the built environment in the black radical tradition. The BRC is also a response to the cultural exclusion of black voices, experience, and histories in the discipline and profession of architecture. And one of the many stark examples being that MoMA, the site of their current show where their work is being shown, um, has only acquired two works by black designers for its permanent collection in its 92 years of existence. The program today uh, was organized uh, by the BRC as one of three events uh, they have done and are going to be doing at schools around the country this semester. The other two programs being at Penn State uh, and USC. Each of these three events have focused on a rejoinder to the Vitruvian maxim, firmness, commodity, delight, which has been inscribed in architectural theory and history through Vitruvius's 10 books on architecture and his description of the ideal man who is European, white, male, and able-bodied. Their most recent presentation at Penn State was titled Black Joy in response to delight. The presentation today at Georgia Tech is titled Black Resilience in response to firmness. Today's event um, is not a lecture, but a discussion and more importantly, a discussion with our students. Um, this ties to one of the core missions of the BRC, which is not to advocate for their own work, 
but rather to focus on supporting the next generation of black artists, architects, and designers to assure that this historic period in the evolution of our discipline is not just a moment in time, but rather a fundamental and sustained shift towards blackness as an inseparable part of the future of creative and cultural production. I wanna thank Mario Gooden, um, many of you know, uh, who's one of the members, founding members of the BRC, uh, for helping to organize this event. And as many, as you, many of you know, he's also our Portman Prize studio critic this semester, working with our second year graduate design faculty and students. And through that has brought um, many of the goals uh, and the kind of ideas of the BRC to our school. And I'm, I'm really grateful for Mario for taking time out of what I know is a crazy schedule that he has this semester uh, to be with us at the school. In addition to Mario, the BRC members include Emmanuel Admasu, Jermaine Barnes, Sekou Cook, Yolanda Daniels, Alicia Davis, Ola Likan Joyfus, Mitch McEwen, Amanda Williams, and Walter Hood. And Walter, as many of you will remember, gave our Doug Allen lecture just three weeks ago. So uh, it was great to have Walter here. And uh, the members of the BRC will be joined uh, in the discussion by our students, Sherrod Bryant, who's a Master of Architecture student, um, who just reminded me and likes to say that he's graduating in a few weeks. Um, Quinn Pham, another Master of Architecture student. Uh, Christian Rariru, who is one of our undergraduate Bachelor of Science in Architecture students. Anli French, another Bachelor of Science in Architecture student and Hiri Dorothy Van Lidlou, a PhD student uh, here in our program. So please join me in welcoming the BRC and our Georgia Tech students in a discussion on black resilience. So I'll hand it over to the students now. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Scott. Uh, I'm very happy, I'm very excited for our conversation today. So I would like to welcome all our guests uh, to Georgia Tech. Uh, we had a, a discussion before how we can, uh, you know, uh, moderate this panel today. And we decided to start with some uh, questions about the exhibition and the uh, Black Reconstruction Collective to set the tone of the discussion for the uh, further questions. And uh, that So first of all, I would like to, uh, I have a two part question for you all. The first part is, uh, where do you position your exhibition, Architecture and Blackness in America, within the current social political state of the United States? And the second part of the question related with that, but more specific, especially considering the, uh, it's important, the importance of exhibiting at Museum of Modern Art. Uh, so the, for example, the uh, 1932 exhibition uh, really set the discourse of the modern architecture, right? So uh, where do you see your exhibition stands in the history of uh, modern Museum of, uh, Museum of Modern Art? Um, maybe I'll, I'll bravely jump in and, um, and uh, maybe try to tackle the first part of, of the question. Um, that, you know, um, we're, we're really conscious that we didn't, um, we didn't put together this exhibition, that the exhibition was something that was, um, thought of by Sean and Mabel many years ago and put together from that standpoint. And then they assembled a pretty amazing panel of, of, uh, uh as Pfizer group that had some, some, some had some, so, so, 
uh, amazing um, um, getting a little feedback. I don't know. Um, but it had some really amazing names on that panel, on that energy group that, that then selected us and put us together. Um, and this was all done way before the killing of 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 Breonna Taylor or or uh, George Floyd and this contemporary conversation around social justice. So um, it's not necessarily coincidental, but maybe prophetic in a certain way that um, the the show kind of had to happen at this time. Um, but a lot of the issues that we were talking about in the country and in architecture specifically uh, for the last eight, nine months are, are things that we've been talking about for several years. And so it wasn't really a new thing that we're trying to position within this moment. It's just something that had to happen at some point. So we want, um, so we're, I, I think it's, it's really great to be having this conversation, but we could have been having this conversation 30 years ago when I was in undergrad, right? Um, we could have been having these same conversations about architecture and blackness. Can I add to that? I don't know if everyone can hear me. We can. Okay. Um, just to follow up, uh, what we were just watching in the video was the installation of um, what we call the manifesting textile, um, which was made to, or positioned to cover the name of Philip Johnson. And Philip Johnson was a white supremacist and part of the kind of founding of the Museum of Modern Art. So in terms of answering the question about where do we position our exhibition in the kind of US and political situation, I would say that, you know, this is, this exhibition is a pushback against um, white supremacy. And it's a pushback against power structures which have held um, black people under for 400 years and the kind of perpetual um, kind of springing up of these, these structures over and over again. So the exhibition is an attempt or is trying to really push back against that. I will also add that when we were discussing with the museum, um, all the curators of MoMA about the potential of using our manifesting textile to cover the name of Philip Johnson that, in fact, um, while we were in that meeting, we were getting kind of background text. I remember receiving one, I don't remember who sent it, saying the Capitol is being stormed. So we were meeting on January 6th and the Capitol was being stormed by directionists. And I think that at that moment, you know, it was very significant and during moment um, to see these, our meeting in conjunction with this kind of event that was going on in the Capitol at the very moment where we were in dialogue with pushing it, pushing back against, um, you know, Philip Johnson's presence in the gallery. So I think that uh, in terms of positioning, it's very clear position to say something about dismantling those structures. If, if I, I could, I like, add, oh. you can go. Uh, yeah, just just briefly, I just want to say, you know, we're not the first black architects exhibited at MoMA. And, um, you know, you started off the question with 1932, just a few years after that, 1936, you have an exhibition on public housing at MoMA that shows Hilliard Robinson's designs for public housing in DC, including the Langston Terrace dwellings, which are, um, you know, a form of New Deal public housing that was basically displaced by a certain form of top-down modernism. Um, so, and, and that was curated by a woman named Ernstine Fantel, who was basically an assistant to Philip Johnson, who then took over when he went to go play around with the Nazis in 1936 for a couple of years. Um, in Europe. So, you know, there are these ruptures. Um, we, we, we know the canon as this kind of, you know, kind of sedimented, you know, reality, but there have always been these ruptures. And I think in addition to pushing back on that, that kind of, that kind of layer, that thick layer of this obvious white supremacy, um, you know, I, I hope what we're doing is also getting people interested to go back and dig in the archive and, and find 
you know, these, these other narratives that are already there. Um, I was just going to add that the show, like one way to think about the show is that from um, an architectural context, from a context of spatial practices, art practices, that um, like from a disciplinary approach that, that what we are doing is, is, is in a way um, making a statement that Black Lives Matter and that when people visit the show, um, you know, and are affected by by the the works that are presented that are encouraged to explore the works that are presented, the views, the narratives, um, the, the kind of absences in discourse, then we're we're actually promoting we're promoting a different view of the built environment, a different view of like the canon, um, and you know, so the work is very much engaged with the current moment. It's also engaged with past moments and the canon. Okay, um, and, uh, actually, Sharad, I was just going to add um, to Yolanda. I would also say that um, to Hari's question about how do we position the work relative to thinking about 1932. Um, and we've said this amongst ourselves, that for us, MoMA is in the rear view mirror, um, that this work is about the future and it's about black uh, cultural production, which really goes beyond, um, let's say, wanting to, to be a part of the canon. I mean, I think if we look at black cultural production in, in, uh, in uh, in, in visual arts, painting, sculpture, and performance, um, I, I said this, I think, maybe at, at Penn State, that black cultural production has been on fire, you know, for, you know, for a while now. And I think this work, even absent of this exhibition, you know, is about the, you know, this current much larger movement in terms of black cultural production, not only the, the resistance or to and pushing back uh, against the architectural canon and and MoMA, I think that's important. But it, I think it's so much more, so much larger than that, so much more than uh, than that. And wanting to be, let's say, constrained within that definition. Well, that goes to the reframing, at least for this series of talks, the reframing of. Um, firmness, uh, commodity, and delight into joy, black joy, black resilience, and black awe. Um, I, I think that's very much about uh, a kind of a shift from an erasure of the black presence to the, the kind of extra, um, like the extra layers, extra ordinary um, aspect that we bring as a people. Yeah, but I mean, I'll, I'll just add to, uh, sorry, uh, to what Mario is saying. I mean, to a certain extent, this is precisely what Black people have been doing to the English language. Uh, it's what Black people have been doing to the colonial gaze of, uh, you know, anthropological photography or uh, ethnography to a certain extent. So we're just bringing that conversation to the discipline of architecture, which has resisted it. Um, but this would happen uh, with or without MoMA. Sorry, Sharad, I, I derailed your question, but we can come back to you now. Miles is uh, just like a question to expand on what we are talking about. Um, so I was just wondering if there's like a conflict of wanting to even be in these spaces, seeing their past and even present values of how they do view black architects, artists, designers, um, and like versus being in a space where maybe you will always or have always felt welcome as being black and art and architect and designer or artist or whatever you are. Um, so like just like what kind of challenges do you face in that um, view of it? I don't know. I Mitch or, 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 or go ahead, Mike. 
I'll say. Yeah. Now, I mean, I was, I was saying, I, I think to a certain extent that was, uh, you know, I mean, I, I believe all of us sort of, you know, find ways to sort of reconcile that reality as well, right? The sense of validation, right? As, as we see it and as, as we understand it, and we pretty much have been trained <laughs> within it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so to then, you know, think of ways to reconcile that reality. And I, I just in a, in, in a kind of fundamental way, I believe the BRC um, is, is our interest in doing that, right? Is our interest in setting the, the platform for these conversations that have been occurring, um, that we've been, you know, that we know they occur, you know, within, within us, within our circles, you know, um, when me, uh, Amanda and Sekou were, were at Cornell in the mid nineties, you know what I mean? We, we, we had such a powerful like synergy and energy. So, so this work has always been, you know, um, being, being created, but of course there's that in a sense, desire for acknowledgement, the belief that we deserve, you know what I mean? This kind of consideration. And I think at least I'll, I'll just speak for myself, the sort of um, kind of reverb, like the reverberating pandemic and the revolution has been occurring is sort of, I know for myself, kind of cause a little, you know, like I, 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 I wouldn't say rift, but a kind of lack of a desire for, for that kind of institutional um, nod, right? Or, or um, just seeing the institution crack across the board, which we know it, it has never worked, right? But having it be so apparent because everyone has to kind of sit still and confront that fact um, has made, you know, the idea of really putting something together and caring less about, you know, getting a, uh, you know, a critique or write up in art form or something, you know what I mean? All these things that we might have in, in, in a sense thought just just for the sense of validation now and to mario's point black black cultural production has been on fire you know and so i mean i think you know i think we're we're, we're discovering kind of this is a great moment to to really you know think of the ways we can provide platform and space for um these conversations to occur outside of that you know uh sort of institutional or high-end venues um to to really acknowledge the work i'd like i'd like to take it to a point of um of double consciousness the 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 um the 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 du Bois concept of of the double consciousness that that every black person has to has to live in that um we have to be it's um this and right um so um we're fully capable of achieving whatever we want to achieve outside of the institution but we still feel a desire to to demonstrate that we can do it within the institution as well it's easy for people to to talk about you know to say um something is illegitimate because it, it's outside of it but when we can um, perform at a really high level inside the institution and take that to a whole nother level then that's that's what um sets us apart from from everything else from what everybody else is is trying to do um you know and all of us have have uh, dealt with that in one way or another in our personal lives or in our careers that we've had to be as good or twice as good as anybody of any one of our peers because um we've been ha we'd have to do what they did and um and also layer on top of it all of the the kind of um, cultural desires that we have for self-expression. Um, so it's it's something that is not like we need a sign off from the from the institution, but that um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's a kind of demonstration that we're we we can do both and right. Um, uh, and it's 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 uh, you know and and I think what what Lake is talking about that the institution the fragility of the institution has shown itself up. To the point where we we know for a fact that we, we no longer need that institutional sign off or release form or whatever we can just kind of start start creating black excellence ourselves i, I think one thing that's important 
Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think one thing that's important is that like a, a product of the show is that for the general public, for students, especially for students, for um, people who are are like in art and architecture, who are interested in the built environment, that this show actually offers many um, kind of strategies and approaches to um, to like represent or to um, dialogue with um, the black experience in um, the built environment and that's very very important um, so so like outside of the, the the fact that it's in this institution um, what it represents I think to to an, another generation who sees this work you know my generation didn't have this to draw off of it it becomes a point where people moving forward have a reference to position their own positions to position their own work and their own aspirations so I, I think that that is an is like an extremely important benefit of the show. Sorry, Amanda. No, it's okay. I was just gonna say, um, uh, one of my art mentors is Kerry James Marshall and his one of his favorite statements is, show up like you belong. And so I think that's always really stuck with me to, and obviously it's easy to say because we're, we're in MoMA, <laughs> But I think if you if you treat it as a as a kind of stasis that's equal to everything else you're doing, then it destabilizes the idea that this is recognition. So if you treat each uh -huh. thing as a single entity that allows it to be something that gives you some sort of benefit of some kind. So in this case, for me, it's the volume of people that will see it. I could really kind of care less about the criticism and the critique. I'm outside of the uh -huh. discipline now officially. So. I'm not as concerned with that. And in fact, it was really helpful in terms of the audience of the work that I was making, imagining that I was talking to Christina Sharp, imagining that I was talking to Dion Brand, imagining that I was talking to Kwasi Dyson. So I'm not really concerned then with the frame of whether or not this is a validation by a MoMA and, and more interested in the idea that 300,000 people might see this because of the platform that MoMA provides but it's actually no more or less important than the Southside Community Arts Center here in Chicago that might exhibit a small painting of mine next week in the all black auction that only 45 people will attend, right? So then if you see the totality of your practice or the totality of your career as kind of uh -huh. it's for different reasons, then it really identical. Now, again, it's easy to say that when you've been in MoMA, right? But, but I think that that's really important as you, as you make career choices or you make professional choices, that you kind of have a stake at every point of what it's, what it's bringing to you and what you're bringing to it, as opposed to what I felt like when I was in school, which is kind of a, a singular aspiration that had a, you know, a kind of linear trajectory with these arcs that meant something. I had to give that up when I, when I quit practice um, formally. Um, to really just be okay with making the work and understanding that was what you were going to be doing the rest of your life. And then the pressure kind of goes away and then somehow magically all the things you thought about that were benchmarks come around anyway, if you're really invested in a particular way in your work and in your practice. Mm -hmm. And I would say, and I would add just one point to that is that, you know, kind of the way um, Amanda really laid it out is a good way to make sure that you're not repeating and reinforcing the idea of being a gatekeeper, right? If you if you are looking at these sort of benchmarks in that particular way, it's very important to understand, you know, um, the way in which Amanda kind of like laid it out to, to sort of avoid just, you know, being being a, a, a black face reinforcing, you know, um, the sort of practices of the institution. I like to return um, yeah. to something Seku was saying earlier about um, this question, which is the both and, which I think ties into uh, what Lake and Amanda were just saying. And that is this, um, I guess, idea of validation that I think one of the 
critical things that, um, you know, this idea of both and the double voiced, um, double voicedness offers is the potential to hold on to your kind of cultural interests, um, predilections and things that you want to try in architecture and bring those, right, really fight to, to bring those forward into the institution in which you're being trained. So um, I guess I'm making an argument for um, not only, you know, being a part of a kind of European tradition, uh, which we all were trained in that European tradition, but also to um, bring the things that you may question the things that you think may not belong, the things that don't work out right, you know, work out immediately uh, and flow smoothly into the kind of um, Eurocentric traditions that um, one was taught. So I, I just wanted to say something about that. I think that double voiceness and this kind of idea of double consciousness actually um, is a kind of We, we lost you at the end there, Felicia. I don't know. Okay, I don't know where you lost me, so. No, you, 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 said, you said this double no. voice, this double consciousness is really kind of, and I really wanted to hear the punchline. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a wonderful space of freedom. It's an opportunity. It's, it's the p potential to see all these different, um, you know, vantage points. Um, and I think it's it's something that uh, enriches work really. So that was the end of what I was trying to say. Beautiful. Glad glad we got it. Got to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, you know, uh, just maybe adding to that a little bit. It's just about finding space for um, a certain form of serial making, you know, and. Today, actually, uh, this afternoon, I was reading um, an article about uh, the poet, uh, the poet uh, Nathaniel uh, Mackey, and how basically he's just obsessively producing poems, you know, and he's he's kind of le spent his whole life. He's 73 now. He's he's just been making uh, books on poetry or uh, like collections of essays, like three or four books a year. And and I think to a certain extent for us, it's really about carving out space where we can be in conversation with people we really admire and ideas that inspire us and, and excite us. And this goes well beyond uh, these institutions and also these disciplines. Uh, I mean, for me, a lot of the inspiration for the work lately definitely comes from outside of architecture. So uh, how do we engage with those practices that you know, black people globally have always been engaged in, uh, whether it's on the continent or off the continent, and how can that be a part of a certain, you know, long extended project that we can we can build on for a very, uh, yeah, for a long period of time. Um, just to go, just to go off that line of questioning that um, uh, Sharad started with uh, the naming of the space according to. Uh, after Phil Johnson. Um, this question is specifically for um, Mitch. Um, so you made a very profound statement for the ex exhibition when you said, and I quote, um, naming communicates values and naming spaces after a person demands a connection between that person's legacy and the future that that institution is committed to. We've seen um, several fights play out across the country against the naming of public spaces and monuments after leaders who were very famously um, anti-black. So many people don't see the importance of naming and often defend these spaces and monuments as homages to their heritage. Um, their focus is mostly on legacies um, and not their impact on the future, as you described in your statement. I want to dive into this into this idea further. Um, what would you say is the relationship between the legacies of symbols such as um, the Confederate flag, monuments, spaces? the names thereof, and uh, the ex Black experience of public space, and how should we begin to redefine and reshape these for, for like, the future? Um, 
Yeah, thank you. I, I feel like in a way you already know the way that you put that, that question together. I think you have an answer yourself. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, I guess I want to already connect this. I've been thinking of resilience already and some of our answers to, to some of these questions about cultural production. Um, and part of, you know, thinking about institutions, sometimes I think I'm too literal. You know, when we're talking about black cultural production being on fire, I, my mind goes to 1967 in Detroit and 1968 in D.C. And I'm picturing already the literal fire, you know, that we have to both set and survive at the same time. Um, and so I guess in a way I want to connect this back to the last question about the institution because there's a way in which we need new institutions, right? I mean, the alternative to this space is something at the Smithsonian that was only built, you know, just a few years ago. Um, so, you know, when we just think literally about the art handling, the physical space, the ceiling, the light, the mechanical equipment, the air, air control, you know, um, there's just not that many places. So when we think about the naming those places, those few places, right, that have the facilities, um, not just the names, right, but that, but that have the resources built into them along with the legacy. Um, there's, a, there's a special responsibility, um, not just to name those things appropriately so that they communicate a message, but so that they indicate the work that is to be done and that needs to be done, right? So um, I, I appreciate you connecting the dots to the Confederate monuments. You know, um, these are obviously, um, you know, these are these are kind of those those acts of naming happened in the 20th century in conjunction with hate crimes and in conjunction with anti-democratic changes. Um, to voting access and, and, and other things along with, with Jim Crow, right? And so I think part of what architecture has not done and what it needs to do, um, not just at this specific museum, but across the board, is, is really look at not just what are the, the, the legacies, um, you know, in the canon in terms of its Eurocentrism, but what are the actual kind of um, the decrees of violence that, that are baked into some of these institutions? Um, what are, what are the, you know, how did we get to some of the things we accept so much in this, I want to connect to resilience. You know, we accept that there's this 20th century urbanism that erased black neighborhoods in order to um, build the infrastructure for white right in the suburbs. But I, for me, that's a crime scene. I'm still looking for the statute of limitations that says, how did this happen? Who was involved and where, where were these decisions coordinated? So that is part of what is implicated, you know, in this specific gallery, in this specific department of architecture and design, actually, this institution, this, 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 this criminal that this space happens to be named after. But this is just part of a much of a much larger, this is just one thread, you know. I've been thinking about this, this idea of naming when the question came up and, and there's this conundrum about like how to name anything like um, uh, can we name everything in our world after truly good people how do we determine who those truly good people are um, and you know we still have to um, I'm completely down with aggressively removing the names of, of, of you know fascists and and white supremacists from our monuments um, but I've, I'm thinking about deeper conversation about like you know um uh you know the 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 scene in roots when when Kunta Kinte refused to give up his name like they had to beat him into submission to name him Toby and that was an act of of ownership like we have to own you we have to own your mind we have to own your body we have to own your sense of yourself and your identity and thinking about even the name of our our country like America is named after an, an Italian explorer, uh, explorer. We don't know what other what atrocities he 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 um, uh, enacted onto this new world that they or this world that was new to them. Um, you know, so we should be rejecting the name of 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 America as well because people lived here before and they had a name, and we decided or someone decided to to um, call this land America 
um, and name them not Americans, name them Indians, <laughs> name them something else. So the act of naming anything is almost an act of violence. Um, so, you know, can, can we find names or can we allow um, places and spaces to, to, and people to name themselves? Um, it's kind of an unresolved thought, but it's something that came up as the question was being asked. Just, just to tag on, I mean, I think it's important the notion that the map is not the territory. Um, and, you know, America, however you pronounce his name, Amerigus, um, you know, he was the geographer. You know, his name got attached to the continent because he, he was not so much sailing with Columbus as he was just drawing the maps. Um, you know, so there's a way in which most naming is happenstance, um, but some names are crime scenes. So I, I just want to make a distinction there. Um, I can go next to the Phoenix question. Um, so this is sort of going off what we're talking about as far as um, these questions of representation and making space and where space is being taken. Um, so talking about maybe some of the exhibition pieces as we're seeing at the, um, in the video that's being played for us, um, what are just some thoughts on why art and design are such powerful and impactful vehicles for expressing ideas and protesting, bringing attention to these inequities. And then also as an extension of that, do you think that architects, artists, and designers have a responsibility to use their skills and work to advance causes and raise consciousness and promote social justice? Um, I'm going to jump in and, and go backwards. The, the, the second portion of your question, um, I would argue that everybody's actually doing it and it gets misnamed. So when you choose to not respond to unearned um, accumulation of goods or property or um, other things that we denote as indicators of value, you too are making a political act. When you don't speak up, you too are making a political act. When you think a line is neutral, you too are making a political act. So I also wanted to sort of destabilize the idea that that what we um, what we engage in is social justice, but what our counterparts who don't want to give name to go back to Sekou and Mitch to, to how they choose to define what a line means and what it connotes, or what a form means and what it, a geometry means and, and connotes, um, those are all political acts. So it's a, it's actually a misnomer and a kind of um, you know sleight of hand to believe that that only people that happen to be brown or historically weren't able to control what the narrative was and who got to decide when the narrative was disseminated are the political ones or the socially just ones, right? It's all an it's all an act. Um, and then to kind of tie then into your first question, um, it's hard I think because we've been doing it so long, but it's hard for me to to not to think of any other medium or format that wouldn't also be doing the same thing. So I don't know if you meant that in the sense of um, kind of a history of certain aesthetics that have to, that have been associated with certain movements, or if you literally meant that art and design and architecture have a different role than say music or theater or literature. Um, to me, they're all kind of continuations and it's all just whatever language is best to um, sort of express whatever it is you're trying to communicate or engage in in terms of a dialogue. So I don't know if that if that was a misunderstanding of your question, but I would I would kind of frame it in that larger sensibility and say that because we are of a shared kind of cloth, we all kind of think about representation in a certain way. But in fact, there's this is going on across other disciplines. It's just ones that we're not always kind of in tune to the way their systems work. Yeah, I'll just uh, piggyback on, on Amanda's comments there. Um, and, and I think one of the, uh, we were talking, uh, you know, in the, in the green, green room before the, you know, before the show um, and commenting that, you know, it takes a while to, uh, to go through the exhibition, um, 
Scott was saying that he spent a couple of hours there. And it's not just like, oh, you go to an architecture exhibition, you see some models, you see some drawings, you, you know, it's, they're immediately legible, if you will. Um, and so I think, you know, just speaking for, you know, well, speaking for myself and for everyone here in the, um, who participated in the, in the exhibition, this was not about being legible. This was not about making form even. Um, and I think Yolanda said this early that early on that, you know, we really think about this as uh, producing or, uh, or uh, displaying, if you will, strategies and approaches and perhaps methodologies for how architecture uh, might not only engage uh, blackness in America, but I would say how architecture perhaps has to kind of fundamentally sort of change and move its focus away from, let's say, the object and the aesthetics of, of the object to really thinking about space and how we inhabit space. Because we know that you know, those relationships are political um, and politics is about power. So whether or not it's acknowledged or not, and whether or not it's power by default, and you know, those of our, of our colleagues who don't acknowledge that, they are still taking that power. So what this work is doing, I think, is uh, is looking at looking at strategies, some which are about subverting, some which are about uh, refusing, but looking at strategies that architecture can uh, can take in terms of thinking about space, not just about you know the aesthetics of the of the object. Of course, things have to look good, and, and I think you know the work in the show. You know, I'll say I think it looks great, but it's not about what it looks like. Um, I think it's really about getting in deeper and thinking about, well, how is this going to perform? How is it, uh, what is the strategy behind it? And I, I'd like to add to Mario's point, because um, as you were, you know, um, laying out your response, I, I, I just realized how much this show embodied both of um, Anli, I'm not sure if that's how, you, how I say your name, uh, like how much, it embodied both aspects of your question, right? Simultaneously, the idea of responsibility and then also the idea of, you know, um, the sort of role and efficacy of, of art and, and architecture and music, whatever, to kind of, I guess, support, um, you know, political action, progressive thought, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this show is incredibly unique in that it does that in a sense, but it does it in a very kind of new and inventive way, right? By expanding the boundaries of what is understood as an architectural show, the architectural exhibit and the architectural medium to the point where there has even been kind of critical, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> right? Like critical responses to this show having been a missed opportunity or having, you know, th there have been, you know, several articles which are saying, you know, either it's a missed opportunity or it, 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 it veers so deep into a kind of esoteric uh, flights of, you know, inventiveness and what does, you know, so, and that comes back to the question of, of, of the show not being legible in that way. It really takes you going through the show to understand that it's doing what you're saying it's not doing. You just haven't seen, right? You haven't seen it in that particular way because the field of architecture the sort of white Western way of understanding architecture, of naming, of naming buildings even. Like, why do we have to name anything? And in our last lecture, we had a conversation about, you know, architecture and the empire privileges the buildings. And, 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 and we are understanding that, you know, the work and the way we navigate through space, it privileges communities, you know? Um, Amanda, in, in the review I sat on with you and, and Ife, you know, um, I can't remember the student's name. I want to say Carmen or something. And Mario, you were on that review as well. Remember we had a conversation about like erasing the building, right? So this was a really dope project that this student had um, that was so detailed along the lines of historical preservation and all these like, you know, ledgers and documents and who sits on these boards all because the Western way of deciding which buildings deserve historical preservation is based on an architectural detail, a classical architectural detail, right? This must be preserved. But these community spaces, these sort of everyday 
whatever, chicken shack, donut shop, you know, wherever, you know, so-and-so's daycare that's so essential to these communities is not viewed in the same way. And so what a lot of us have done in this exhibit is really investigate the community, the spatial, right, the human interaction that 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 extends value to these spaces, which architecture in, a, in you know, in, in, in the Western way of understanding fundamentally doesn't. We privilege the star architects that does these amazing buildings. That is who is going to be, you know, the most renowned, most in, as, as opposed to, you know, really, really looking at you know, the, the way we confront space as a community, as all communities engage with space. Um, and so, yeah, Mario, as you kind of broke it down, I thought about the question, I was like, wow, it's really doing it, but it, it, it is not going to be apparent to some that it's doing that work until you challenge the very, until you challenge your very fundamental understanding of architecture and space and what is value, you know, and, and kind of all of those things. Um, so I think that's really the kind of remarkability of, of, of this show. I just want to add something to what you're saying, Lake, and also something that Amanda said earlier. Um, and it relates to this idea of um, responsibility and really kind of sensing the environment through your specific body. So as a black man or as a black woman, um, you experience and have different kind of interactions with what is around you. And I think uh, when one becomes a designer that the personal is in fact political. So this is going back to something Amanda was saying that in your skin, in your body, um, and this is for everybody, uh, who you are and what you do, and what is understood and taken away from that is related to the specifics of how you are in in an environment so the personal is political so there is no potential separation i think this is also a kind of um point of connection with the vitruvian uh, body that um you know vitruvius has has drawn that we all uh, have really particular stress points and ways of dealing with things in the environment and, and joy points, right? All these things, we're all each uh, individual and different. And so that um, this is important, I think, to think about uh, when looking at your skills as a designer to also imagine, if you can imagine your own sort of um, understanding in a, in a space, imagine others right imagine people who are not like you so it really does bring you to thinking about a kind of larger collective thinking about the specifics of your own your own body so i just wanted to uh, add to that uh, idea of this response being responsibility yeah i'll just um maybe add to that and, and take it back a little bit to what Lake was saying around preservation. I, I always use this example with my students uh, of, you know, the, the rock carved churches in Ethiopia from the 12th century that have always been occupied and used by people. Uh, I mean, they're, they're falling apart, they're cracking, but people continue to use them. And recently, I mean, I think maybe about 10 years ago, the EU decided they're going to put this massive metal, uh, roof on top of uh, these rock carved churches. So there is a superimposition of a certain idea of preservation, a European idea of preservation on uh, you know, these African churches. So I think to a certain extent, a lot of what we're doing is fighting against this dominant worldview that has really dominated the world for the last 500 years. Um, and that colonial gaze is precisely what we're attacking through this work. Um, and if we don't challenge that value system, then it will continue <laughs> to to cause harm on the planet. And it's continuing to render the planet as a space that is uninhabitable. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, this this has to operate in the realm of spatial practice, but also it, it has to operate in the realm of knowledge production. And I think a lot of the discourse we're building around the work is, you know, fighting against uh, these these value systems. I just want to use a quick second, Emmanuel, to piggyback on that and say the 
the catalog then, the field guide, also does a tremendous amount of that work. And I think it can't be separated um, from what we're talking about. It actually, uh, from my mind, it, it lays almost a stronger foundation for what we're talking about. Um, obviously, we are a kind of snapshot, but I think that, you know, I can imagine having that that document. It gives every, every, I mean, I'm going to be with that thing for, for decades to come now. And I've been invested in this for 25 or 30 years. So I would encourage all of you to definitely get the, get the field guide if you don't have it already. Um, especially those, those seniors or those folks that are coming to, <laughs> to moments of reckoning with what they want architecture to mean for them um, going forward. Uh, Quinn, uh, I don't know uh, if you got to ask your question, and I know we perhaps want to take some questions from uh, from the audience. Um, and I don't see. Oh, there you are, Quinn. Hi. Um, yeah, we were. Okay, yeah, I, I can ask my question, and I think this ties into kind of the conversation about Eurocentric education. Um, and Yolanda, I was, you know, particularly drawn to your work as a city planning student. And I've learned things in my city planning education that I would have never learned in um, architecture school. So kind of, you know, um, you had talked about a settlement in um, Los Angeles and just the larger idea of like urban renewal. We always talk about the buildings that replace those neighborhoods, but we don't really talk about those neighborhoods and those communities. Um, and through my city planning education, you know, we talk about the rich social network, um, which you touched upon with Biddy Mason and how she was able through her relationships to um, sue and win her freedom, but also to develop this kind of community um, in Los Angeles. And so through my city planning education, I, I've learned to read the landscapes in different ways where, you know, maybe um, our American history looks at highways as this wonderful infrastructure that connects the, the whole country, but then um, learning that history that that I feel like has been concealed is, you know, seeing those highways now as scars within our landscapes that are meant to um, harm communities. And so I was wondering if, you know, through your, um, through developing your installation, what, what do you, um, for students who might not have that education, that history, um, how do, would you recommend that we read landscapes just to kind of start to understand hidden histories that are I feel like hidden in plain sight um, to really understand where, you know, if we go into a project, into a neighborhood, how to, can we start to understand that there might be some history there that we need to be cognizant of um, as we work as designers in that space? Um, I think um, uh, they definitely like hidden histories is, you know, is apropos, like, um, my impression is that all over uh, the country there are hidden histories like there are in the widest spaces there are black presence like a, a past history of the presence of um, black people people of color minorities and it's been repressed and I, I see the current moment as a moment of um, revealing Many, many people working to, um, you know, independent of each other, most of them, um, very project of revealing these. Um, so I think like projecting forward, um, there will be, I think they will be connected. Um, but as it stands right now, there, it's almost like a constellation of points that um, some are known by some, some are not known. Um, but I would I would just suggest that um, like right now I'm teaching a class on infrastructure where we're looking at you know these things that are seen as being um, kind of uh, mute in terms of their ability to um, we don't usually think of them as as in terms of social infrastructure but like a highway, something that um, in the United States has been used to displace African American communities, um, you know, like methodically displace African American and dismantle African American communities um, 
we're starting to talk about that now. Um, the way that just um, utilities and power and um, housing projects, all of all of the things that we kind of think of in terms of building blocks for a city and being kind of neutral, they're not neutral at all. And so it may not be that the history is something that you can look in one source and find. So I would just suggest that one has to one has to just be um, more persistent than you know thinking that you can find it in one book because it won't be in one book. It will be in many sources. It will be across time. So you may be looking in the 60s. You may be looking today. There is quite a bit of research today, but a lot of it. Um, kind of picks up from research that was done in the 60s and 70s and that was then aborted in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then also looking to other disciplines because other disciplines have been making these connections, especially through American studies, African American studies, um, feminist studies, these connections, post-colonial studies, these connections have been made in other disciplines. And by looking at space as a larger framework, spatial practices as a larger framework, the connections can be drawn. But if you're looking for, you know, looking in like architecture narrowly, or even I think urban planning narrowly, you won't find it. You have to look more broadly. And it goes to what Amanda was, was saying about how, you know, these different fields are actually connected. Um, if you look, at you know the experience, the black experience. And often when I say black, I mean not just black people, but people who are not part of the white supremacist, you know, privileged group um, are are all there are different forms of blackness, but they're all kind of relegated other. And so you you can you can actually um, you know see this fluidity across the disciplines that that can be um, inspiring for your discipline, that can give you strategies for your discipline, methodologies for your discipline, but you have to just be a little bit stubborn and and just, you know, kind of maybe a little creative about how you interpret things from outside your discipline into your discipline. So, uh, Sharad or Hari, I don't know if we want to open it up for the Q&A now. So we have a few questions coming in. Oh, yeah, we also have some similar questions. So we will add them into our discussions later. Uh, we actually would like to move with this discussion of Vitruvius and the Vitruvian theory of Fermitas and in relation to resilience and then Vitruvian, but then its representation as a Eurocentric man. And my main question here is, uh, one of the themes that we have been discussing today is of course the architect's role as a space maker and the importance of space production. And in Vitruvian theory, actually uh, space is a byproduct, is a side product of the structure. The building exists as a structure first and the space is just created around there and people find their uh, habits and the rituals uh, within that rigidity of the structure, right? And utilitas is a very ambiguous term because uh, sometimes we translate it as a function or program or whatever it is, but it's more about the habits of people. It's more about the rituals of the community and the society, right? So uh, within this uh, duality of rigidity of the fermitas and the ambiguity of the utilitas. Uh, where do you position the, or where do you think the resilience occur? Uh, how can we be more active within this uh, dichotomy? That's, uh, I would like to hear your comments about that. Can I, can I just start off without disturbing I find this, this question actually? Um, I want to I want to link it back to to what we were talking about with Yolanda's project in a way. I mean, the, the classical framework in architecture. I, I have a colleague that in, in classics that I, I need to connect with more. Who who from within classics? Dutnell, 
um, Padilla, who is, is kind of, you know, dissecting the white supremacy at, in classics to the point where he said, maybe classics shouldn't exist. Um, and he's one of the leading classicists. And he's saying, maybe, maybe this field is so rife with white supremacy that it shouldn't exist. And I think when, when we're talking, you know, um, and we have a national stage in this country, I think it's important in architecture why that we take a step to really say, why are the classics so significant for us? And, and when you think about, you know, American architecture and its presentation of the fluted columns and then taking the tobacco leaves and putting them on the top of the columns and all this, part of where those games come from is that, you know, this is a country founded by, by sex traffickers, right? Kidnappers, sex traffickers who call themselves farmers who had to negotiate with religious zealots. What are they going to agree about? You have religious zealots and you have professional sex traffickers. All they're going to agree about is Vitruvius. And so then we're going to be sitting here talking about Vitruvius because that's all they could agree about. Woo! So I want to connect this to what Yolanda's project puts out. And I went there to the exhibit with a law professor and her take on Yolanda's project was so different than mine. She was immediately reading all the cases and, and she was doing it the way that we would go look for one of our own projects. If we saw a big drawing, you know, and she was looking for a case that she did at the NAACP when she was an intern. And it was there and she knew where to look for it. And her reading, she was just studying and looking at all the cases and how they lined up. And she said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, what? What, what are you seeing? And she said, these are all bad cases. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's basically saying that what, what Yolanda's project was tracking was all the ways that bad case law, if you think about the Dred Scott decision, for example, all the ways that bad case law at the municipal level, the state level, were building on the precedent upon precedent upon precedent to the point that now she's got to do constitutional law to unravel this stuff because it all happened at the level of some stupid turnstile in a bus somewhere. So, you know, we have to be aware of the extent to which precedent itself is a trap. I mean, resilience is another trap, right? But, but precedence itself and the classics themselves are such deep traps that we are now here faced with this question that you just asked. I'm, I'm so glad Mitch did that because I, I was sitting here thinking about how I'm going to like uh, try to break down the whole idea of the classics or the whole idea of Vitruvius. And um, yeah, I couldn't have done it any better than Mitch just did it right now, but it's totally necessary. And I'm, I, well, I'll just go I'll just go to Bob Marley to, to you know, to uh, to pay homage to my Jamaican ness. Um, and one of his most profound lines for me was uh, total destruction is the only solution, right? Like you, you have to just burn that shit down <laughs> to start from scratch, right? Like, and if we think about it in another way, you know, to, to think about like what the real disease and cancer in architecture is, um, that uh, virtually every other space of cultural production has completely, uh, severed their, their dependence from the classics, <laughs> has completely liberated themselves from any kind of sense of classicism. You know, um, theater, music, literature, art um, are, are thousands of miles ahead of architecture. And we're still in a place where uh, uh, we can have a, um, a, a presidential executive order that says that the only style that is appropriate for building federal buildings is a classical style. And, and people are signing on to this and saying that this is a good idea. And it's, and it's fucking nuts, right? Um, and this is like emblematic of how, how, um, you know, how, how connected or tied down we are to, to, um, to the classics in architecture that doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's just this sickness that we have. As as architecture architectural professionals and architectural thinkers. Well, but I do think it exists in like many disciplines. You know, like in writing, they've gone through this, and um, I, I think you know one way to think about the show is that like what we present, and and it's not just us, but you know, as examples in architecture, parallel to examples in literature or in art or in other disciplines is that we're presenting another model. So there's not one model and the one model that's 
you know, that, that prevalent is bankrupt. So I think what, what you have to, what you have to kind of accept is that there are multiple models um, to draw from. And so, so like just in terms of the way that we chose the, the themes this, um, for the spring semester, talks was essentially like looking at these terms, these Retrievian terms. And what's really interesting about them is that they're all, they basically all um, kind of add up to a, a system of white supremacy and a foundation of repression. So like firmness is about object making, it's about the object. Uh, delight is some sort of form of repression of joy. Joy, joy is like unbounded. Delight is, delight is intellectualized and it's small. And then commodity, commodity is commodification. And, and like as people who have been, who come from people who have been commodified, like what is the opposite of commodification? It doesn't exactly, there is no definition, there is no definition for it. And so, so the, the thing that cannot be commodified is awe. And so that's how we chose the terms that we came with, which is the things that are outside of that system of repression, outside of that system of supremacy, white supremacy. And that's where we drew the terms from. So it does present a different model, a different model than the Vitruvian man, a different model than the classical ideas of architecture. And it's not something that's that I, I think is one thing, because if you look at our work, there are multiple multiple voices, multiple approaches, and, and that's good. Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, with my colleagues. I mean, I, you know, and uh, with Danielle Padilla at, at Princeton about dismantling the, the discipline um, and Sekou, you know, burning the shit down. But once it's burnt down, there's a body in there that I think we want to do an the autopsy of because that body has been inscribed in the whole of architecture um, not necessarily that we're going to replace it with another body but uh, going back to the discussion about about naming i mean i do think that the autopsy you know how you know how did this happen um what was that body sort of excluding so yeah let's burn the thing down but also you know do the autopsy and then construct something new, construct you know, whether or not it's a new discipline by burning this one down, constructing a new discipline, uh, whether it's not uh, you know, about understanding other kinds of bodies and making space and so moving the emphasis from the object or from the form. And there was something that Emmanuel said, and I, I, I tell this to my students, I think it was at our first talk last fall that, um, that for us it's about flow, not form. I'm paraphrasing, I think, Emmanuel, right? And Jermaine's not here today, but he presented this brilliant drawing of this Corinthian or Doric column, which was not like this straight up, but had a little lean to it. And I thought, man, that is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about that kind of space. We're not talking about the, um, the firmness, commodity, delight, but we're talking about something which is much more you know, it's it's laid back on the side, you know, sliding through, being subversive, you know, you know, maneuvering. It's doing all of that kind of stuff. It's it's about the flow, not the form. I would I would also argue, you know, for me, two things that. Um, oh, did I go? Can you hear me? Yeah. Go away? Okay. I would argue. I would argue two things also. I think that for me, I keep wanting to go back to like etymology and like the root of these words because I haven't studied in a long time and I can recall there was a moment where the way we already kind of their exact um in its original way it was it was being used, right? And then it was for a moment. So I used to teach at IIT and it drove me crazy that Mies was, you know, pushing forward with some ideas about um, limits of performance of materiality and we're like to the T repeating everything he was doing like it was biblical grave this is not how it's supposed to be operationalized and so what is your as, as you're a scholar right now building this new knowledge what is your argument for what should be these foundations if, if we've all been taught that was like the first drawing we saw in first year or something right like 
what should be the first drawing and what is it representing and what is it trying to be the foundation for so I can, you know, we can argue back and forth about the about the specifics of it. But if this is the scholarship that you're going to be doing, those are the two things that I would want to be asking you or be having a longer conversation with you about. What are the kind of roots of how he he got to this theory or to these terms? What is the whole wormhole? You know, like what are you what are you mimicking? Are you reinforcing it or are you trying to get to the source of what it means in the moment? Why would it then be used to create the Vitruvian man? What does that look like now? What are your politics behind it? Like all of that's much more interesting to me. You see that we in a couple of hours were like, nope, it's gonna be awe and joy and like <laughs> we we knew, right? We and I don't know why we knew, we just knew. So what is what is that kind of correlation for you about those models that Yolanda's talking about that really shape the foundation of what arguments you are gonna make, what you are gonna teach? Hard to be like super interesting to me to think about in relationship to you, your excitement about the subject matter. All right, um, I think we're going to shift it now to the Q uh, to the Q and A questions. Um, so Steve, we got a question earlier on in the chat. Um, they said. Um, Felicia noted that all of us were trained through a European pedagogy. Architectural education has to change. Um, how does architectural education, and they asked, how does architectural education have to change? And if I may expand on this, I would also ask, um, how would you go about imp implementing your changes? Because I see, like, you probably have to go through, like, NAP and, like, the accreditation and see, like, of how they can change their own rules and policies. So if anyone could speak on that. You know, my response is the same as the previous response, right? Yeah. I was going to say we, we answered that question. <laughs> it just got answered. Bob Marley really? for everything. <laughs> Marley for all. Bob Marley for all. Just just repeat that line over and over again. I mean, I don't, I don't know how technical we want to get, but one of the things that we're doing at the, at the faculty where I'm, you know, teaching at Princeton, um, we're, we, we've got a committee that is trying to figure out, um, how you even scan the curriculum, you know, um, and basically not that we're going to do it in a semester, but even just kind of figure out how to commission the doing of it, really thinking of this as a design project. So how do we, how do we map the world that the current curriculum even projects, right? Um, in terms of its, its sources and its citations or even the sites of studios. Right. So, so maybe it will be some kind of digital live mapping kind of, you know, program that comes out of what this committee is asking for. But we have to have a way of even sort of um, having an X-ray vision um, into what the what the curriculum is, uh, is assuming. I would add to that that in like many universities right now, there is. Um, you know, there is a lot of soul searching going on, like where, like, say, GSAP is um, at Columbia. They're doing they spent the whole year um, researching their ties to white supremacy, like the curriculum's ties to white supremacy. And so other universities are, are doing um, other exa examinations of their curriculum. So that's kind of like part of the landscape that we exist within. Um, I think like the question of, of NAB is, is a really interesting one. And I actually really like, um, Monica Ponce de Leon's, um, suggestion to just get rid of the exam, right? Like to just get rid of these bodies. But that's like a real radical proposal. And there need to be a, a series of, I think, like smaller gestures to even get that proposal implemented. But it needs that kind of thinking. Um, to, you know, and her logic is that the rate that we're going, the change is so incremental that it's ineffective. So just get rid of the system if we really, really want integration. That's Bob Marley again, too. But, um, <laughs> so yeah, let me, but, let me give uh, I was but, gonna say, but let, let me add um, to that question, Sherrod, or to, to that answer. Um, 
and maybe this might also uh, get to one of the other questions in the chat, is that I'll speak for us, um, people of color, it's not our job. I mean, that unlearning whiteness is, I would say, it's not your job to tell your school what to do, um, that the school needs to take on that project uh, itself. Um, and it's, and it takes more than a semester. I mean, just, you know, as, as Mitch was saying, you know, at, at Princeton, at, at Columbia, this is an ongoing project, but it's, uh, I would say it's a project that um, should not be put upon the shoulders, you know, of minority students and students of color um, to undertake. That it's really, and maybe I'm gonna get in, in trouble for, for saying this since I'm only a visitor at, at Tech, but it's really, uh, you know, it has to be done at the institutional level, it has to be done at the faculty level in terms of interrogating, really committing to doing the work of interrogating the, you know, the curriculum because it's not up to people of color to explain white supremacy to those who assume, you know, they're privileged. Uh, thanks, Maria. I was just gonna um, add um, a little bit of an analogy so that, that people don't think I'm a complete anarchist. Um, but uh, so um, there is, and it, it connects to this conversation about, about um, whether you operate inside or outside an institution as well. Um, that I, I remember a few years back, I was designing a, a, a house for a, a client's uh, family of uh, clients of mine, a family, you know, family of five, and they had this house that they'd been living in for about 10 years, and the, the house was about 80 years old, and it had been changed and adapted so many times. There's so many different layers of modifications, things that we couldn't track and things that couldn't work for them. I was, I, and we did four months of design and redesigns and redesigns trying to get their family to really fit into this house, to live in this house. And the end of that four month process, we were like, okay, we just got to design a whole new house, right? And we found them a whole new lot and designed a whole new house from scratch. And it finally worked for them. Um, they didn't end up building that house. <laughs> That's beside the point. Um, the, the point is that, you know, I, and I've seen this, um, this is at the core of my decision to, to shift from, from Syracuse to, to UNC Charlotte is that um, I, I, there is nothing more that I could do within this space, within this faculty to create the space that I needed to operate in. Um, and uh, going to a new space in a, in a program that is urban design, not architecture, so it doesn't have um, all of the institutional um, requirements for accreditation and all that. It's a small, nimble program. This is a space that, you know, something new can be created. Um, so that's, that's, that's super exciting. And I think we have to think about um, creating those new types of spaces in, in architecture writ large and just kind of sidestep the whole process of trying to change institutions. Well, I, I will say one thing, though. I mean, to me, um, and a lot of these institutions, I feel like the curriculum is trying to catch up to the students because I think the politics of the students is actually well beyond <laughs> uh, what the curriculum uh, is providing. So the advice I've been giving the institution that I'm in at RISD is like, you know, read the documents that were prepared by the students last summer and take those seriously. And I think almost every school of architecture has a student body that has prepared a critique of the curriculum. Maybe not Princeton, okay. Maybe not Princeton, but um, I think a lot of these institutions have students who are doing radical work of reimagining what it means uh, to you know, teach or learn architecture. So uh, if Princeton students haven't done that, then they should uh, collect <laughs> these documents from other schools, but, but it's there, you know. Um, been written. And you know, the wanna... work is, I just want to jump in real quick before you guys switch. You know, the work is long. You know, Yolanda talks about how there was nobody when they were there. And then we're, Lake and I, school, right, we are half a step beyond, behind that. And
we just have our own curriculum. You know, we're less forward. You know, we're not even a full generation really from you guys. And, and we're talking about an exhibition. We're talking about um, shifting the landscape at National African American Museum of History and Culture a year ago, or two years ago, three years ago, forget COVID year, three years ago, right? Like we've come full circle on a lot of these things. You all gotta do the work. You gotta push. If it's unacceptable, you gotta be courageous enough to be like, it's unacceptable. You know, parents will be crying or whoever's paying for you to be there, get nervous, but you gotta say it's unacceptable. You know, we're in the, it's me too. So you can't look at me funny. It's it's the Pandalusian Revolimic or whatever Lake calls it, right? That you can't, it doesn't fly anymore. Don't show me Khan. Let's look over here at, at, at Masu, right? Like you gotta, you gotta be on it too. We've been lulled so long into knowing that it's unacceptable that we, it's a comfort blanket. It's like, well, let me pull one of these three. Let's see, it's about light, let's go with Khan. It's about so-and-so, let's go with so-and-so. It's easy, right? So you gotta do the work too. Like the, the, the strides that have been made, and this is not to excuse these institutions, they have to step up as well. But I think you have to demand it and you have to be ready to get the C minus or to be arguing or to, or to rise up together. This is the origin of the BRC. Because we are a bunch of people that already knew that this is what's necessary when stuff is not the way it's supposed to be. Like, we're dope. I'm not going to let you fake like we're not dope. So why are these conditions existing? This is unacceptable, right? So you can walk, you can, you can protest, you can start a new institution, you can rip open your shirt in the opening. Like, you know, you pick whatever your lane is. Everybody's got to do the work. Everybody come this far, so like I can't imagine your kind of next step wrong. Um, there's just a question here that I really want to get to. Um, disclaimer: This is one that's very shrouded in uh, doubt. <laughs> And I just want to say, uh, you guys should, uh, just for the sake of educating and for uh, very respectfully, please uh, <laughs> read it. But um, uh, it says, how do spaces and buildings fail to represent blackness? Are you trying to push the message that current architecture does not reflect black people's past and past experiences and struggles as well as current experiences of black people. Well, I, I'll just say something. I think the, in, in a way, the obvious answer is that we are saying that um, the experiences of um, Black people are not um, are not represented in uh, the built environment. Uh, maybe they're not represented and valued um, in the way that that they could be. So there is a lost opportunity to understand. Um, I'll just talk about my project and like just to be really specific. So in looking at Los Angeles, um, I I, I didn't really know what I was going to find. I had an idea that I was going to look at housing segregation, which is something I'm interested in. But what I found in looking at um, black settlement in Los Angeles were these amazing narratives of resilience, um, amazing narratives of black autonomy, of uh, black community, of, of black people with far less means than any of us have, you know, someone who was a slave, was enslaved, who then became free, who basically, um, you know, kind of petitioned for freedom, got free, and then worked and worked and saved and amassed property, but but not by themselves, but through like through a connected community with other African Americans doing the same thing. So freedom came as a result of a connection to other African Americans who were free or enslaved and like amassing property came through 
also this kind of connected community. But these stories are not, um, and these are stories that um, exist in places in Los Angeles that people, they don't know they exist. And, and so there's this erasure of the black presence in the landscape. Um, so I think like one way to address your question is that uh, the history of the black presence in America as we know it right now, largely exists through erasure. Um, and the work, at least the work of, of some, is, is, um, is kind of um, uncovering that history. And it's important because the contemporary condition is framed by those erasures, is framed by the violence of those erasures, something Mitch was talking about earlier. And then like projecting into the future, like, you know, it's very hard to project into the future when um, a past is even denied, right? Like, so the black experience in America is one where um, our past is denied, where our humanity is denied, where our value is mapped onto landscapes that are basically, you know, the results of acts of terrorism. And then we're, we're um, held accountable for this act of devaluing and terrorization of our very selves. So um, I, I'm I'm sorry if if maybe this isn't a kind enough, gentle enough answer, but um, I think that um, there are many stories that need to be told and a, a, a past that needs to be recognized, and and it's not just African Americans like. You know, the American Indians are, that's a whole other story of total decimation and violence in the landscape and violence against people that exist today. And even the way that we're treating immigrants. So there are multiple um, kind of reverberations of this pattern um, that, you know, need to be addressed. And I'm going to stop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'll just add, add to that because um, I think this is very important. Um, yeah, uh, yes, the, the black experience relative to architecture has been erased or relative to the built environment has been erased. And then when it hasn't, it's always been pejorative, right? So to, and we, and we know those tropes, right? Um, there was one article that was written about the, the show, I can't remember what, who wrote it or what magazine or journal that was in. But the first sentence mentioned Pruitt Igo. And I just thought, okay, here we go with, you know, this writer did not know how to approach the work. So the writer's reference for thinking about blackness and architecture comes back to the same trope of, of poverty, of, you know, of the ghetto, of, you know, of all of those things. So blackness and architecture, if it hasn't been erased, it's always been pejorative. And so I think what, you know, what I'm trying to do, I think what, what you know, our colleagues here are trying to do is we're flipping the script to kind of show that you know, this is, blackness is not pejorative, um, that it's productive, that, and it's not about seeing the built environment or seeing architecture in those usual ways in which blackness is somehow always thought to be a pathology relative to, relative to architecture and relative to the, to the built environment. So while the, this conversation in which we're using the word whiteness might be uncomfortable, blackness has always been uncomfortable relative to architecture and relative to discussions of the built environment. Black people have always been made to feel uncomfortable relative to these spaces. So that this conversation perhaps flips that script, um, I think is, you know, is a lesson for, for all of us, but hopefully it's a productive lesson such that we see that out of this uh, comes again to these strategies for, you know, for productive creativity. So, Marius, I would, I would, jump I would, in. Go ahead, Amanda. No, I, was gonna say, I, would, I would actually, kind of jumping on what Mario's saying, I would actually like to maybe come at a slightly different angle to the question of whether or not blackness is not being represented and, and uh, kind of collapse it with Professor LeBlanc's comment about kind of whiteness unqualified as pejorative and smash those two things together in the way that Mario was talking about. There was a great op-ed, I wanna say in like 2015, that was called What is Whiteness? 
in um, the New York Times, and it was right after, um, let's say, Charleston and the and the um, the violence that happened there. And it was talking about this kind of like sickness that so many um, white people, white in a reductive term, right, felt because they realized for the first time that all these people thought they were Donald Trump. <laughs> and so the the kind of like ability to just not have to think about it um, get, gets kind of collapsed with people that never get to be nuanced. And so now we're all in this moment of uncomfortableness where people for the first time realize that they've been reduced and you have another body of people that are refusing to be homogenous. So you got 10 blacks here. I did a series all summer long that was based on all these solidarity statements about blackness. And at you know, day four, I was like, which black? My ghetto uncle who puts my cousin's name, utility bill in my cousin's name, or the bougie ones over here that don't want me to come to that, like which black? And which black am I on any given day? And then earlier, love me some modern collage. Amanda, you're getting censored because every time you really get into it, your your your, your, your internet is cutting out. My internet is seeing seeing me. Which which black? Which white? Which architecture? Yeah. Right. And so I think that that's a that's a conversation that that Georgia Tech has to engage in collectively and really get to the root of of what kind of homogeneities you've been accepting and promoting and and what kind of homogeneities have been collapsing things unnecessarily. So what I love about the show is you, you got at least 10 blacks here, if not hundred, right? Like on any given day, my project means something totally different to me, let alone you all and all these people viewing it, right? So um, I think Emmanuel, for me, his project does the most to talk about the quotidian or this kind of um, emphasis right now across all kinds of Black creative spheres of really just celebrating the everyday and the extra roll of fat over here and the Waffle House. And, the you know, so it's not only that that Blackness is erased in some kind of um, intellectual or elite way. It's also that all the places that we love the most, that we have the best memories of, don't get elevated. And so I think that's a beginning conversation about how these terms reduce people and how that reduction either um, augments things that shouldn't be or downplays or erases things that should be. And I think that's where the that's where you that's where you start to get at a beginning discussion for middle ground. Um, so I hope that tackles two of the questions at once, so we can get to a few more before. And, and I just one, that one, one, one okay. reference. I was just going to drop, like for for Professor LeBlanc, um, Nell Painter wrote a book called The History of White People. I think that's a really good reference uh, to help with this conversation. Yeah, um, I was going to say I, I I get the question, I understand it. The um, the uh, um, that is being used unqualified, and I think Amanda is getting at the 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 sense that black is is always historically been used unqualified. Um, and uh, I'm going to come back to Bob Marley, and when he says "chomikan um, minakalafal," right? That's basically saying that you know I put it out there. I didn't tell anybody. I wasn't calling anybody's name specifically. So if we're saying white in a pejorative sense and you feel offended by it, then maybe that's the kind of white that, that, that you're associating with. Instead of saying that you are somehow separate from that specifically pejorative kind of whiteness. Um, so uh, I think that um, obviously we know that there are, are um, uh, uh, many types of people who somehow get put into categories by our um, institutions. But those institutions are, are by definition, racist institutions um, and um, privileges uh, some people over others. And regard if you if you're not able to understand your own um, position within that place of privilege, then um, you are participating in that same system that is uh, keeping the unprivileged down. So um, if if you don't think that uh, some of the things that we're saying that may be um, pejorative about white people or white institutions or white structures relate to you, then it, it shouldn't have, have um, uh, sparked any kind of 
specific concern on, on your part. Um, so segging from that, let's, um, there are a couple questions in chat that I think are pretty related as far as um, how we encourage our schools and our professors to be, to include more diverse material, more inclusive material. Um, and we've touched a little bit on this, um, Amanda, you were saying that a way for students to do this is to be proactive in our studies. and. Um, you know, bring different examples, more diverse examples other than just Mies, Khan, um, Le Corbusier. Um, but I think these questions are getting a little bit more into how we approach um, the administration and the faculty when it seems like things aren't moving, even when we are pushing for them. So one of these questions is, how can architecture students demand the current architecture program professors to be more inclusive of non-white architects in our studies without jeopardizing our chances for successful completion of our program? And another is what are students supposed to do when they bring all of these things to the table and the administration and faculty ignore them or blow them off? Amanda, what did we do at Cornell? <laughs> <laughs> So right, I again, so when we had numbers. Well, I mean, we were, this was this was a this was a we were unicorns, right? You're talking about you're talking about numbers that out our percentage of representation within the school was in excess of what it is in the United States. So think about that, right? So we just showed up at reviews. Excuse me, you're not allowed to talk. Can you explain what the third drawing is? Because I can't see it from back here. Get your line weight up. We just yeah. became our own professors. That's very easy to yeah. say when you have 40 people. I don't know, you know, like I don't know where I don't know where your where your level of courage and, and kind of activism lies, right? Easy for me later on to say, you know, for fear of of uh, repudiation, what are you afraid of? So either you're getting an inadequate education or you're pissing somebody off. So you have to decide. I don't know who's paying for it. I don't know what the stakes are if you don't stay there. These are all decisions everybody's got to make. But just remember that it's long. And I don't mean this to, to absolve the school of stepping up if they need to be doing something or the students to be rallying together. But your arc is long. So you really have to have those, those conversations with yourself about what you want your relationship to be to this, to this discipline, not this profession. I'm as committed to architecture now as I was then, but I will refuse to participate in the profession. It's not, it's not, it doesn't provide a shape for me. That doesn't mean I don't support everybody else for whom it does provide a shape. So these are really difficult questions. You have us to bounce, you know, to have as a kind of quiet ear, but I think these are really questions you guys have to ask and they can't be about permission and it's not gonna be about politeness. There's no polite change. So, you know, do it now, do it 10 years from now. I don't know, like I, I can talk it because it was 40 of us. I mean, I don't know what yeah. I would have done if one of me in a school. So earlier someone said um, it should not be the position of people of color to make the change, but ultimately that's what it comes down to. If you really think about it, it has to be to make a change. Uh, you are the one that really cares about where you are going to go in the world it has to be you right so there is going to be there is going to be some pushback work and um it's it's often not very pleasant and it makes people uncomfortable and that's how it is um, but yeah there will be some pushback work if you want to make a change in your education then it has to be you and you will have help I think once to, people uh, see, that's what the BRC is here for now. We didn't have any BRC when we were going through. We had we had uh, mentors in Noma, so I feel grateful for that. I'm grateful to all the people that went through before me and talked to me as a as a young architect. Um, but now you have the BRC and all those people who are practicing, uh, who you can reach out to for help. I would add yeah, I that there are also other organizations like um, I would say they're, they're, the work that you need to do is just finding out about what other 
students are doing in other universities because many letters have been written and um, like Mario said, and there is a lot of activity going on. I, I think at most campuses, something is happening. And so, and it's, and it's also across races. It's not just, you know, it's not just minorities doing the work. It's all students wanting change. And so, um, change in, in universities and institutions historically has happened through students through students protesting, through students pushing, um, and making, you know, the instructors make the change or drawing the connections between the instructors who are um, kind of agents for change. And so students actually have power. Um, you're paying the bills, actually. You have power. And when you band together, your power is more than you actually understand. But then also, like just looking at all of the anti-racist pedagogies and anti-racist projects that are going on that you can draw from. So Dark Matter University is one, um, you know, there, which is looking at curriculum. Um, uh, Black Space as an organization has these kind of um, uh, workshops you know, that are ways of like getting people to talk about race and space and revaluing um, black space. And so there are, I don't know, comrades, like there, there are people you can learn from and there are people you can work with um, to further your efforts. Yeah, I mean, uh... <laughs> I think this is a really productive conversation. I mean, I, I come from a country where a student movement toppled the monarchy, you know, and I, I think a student movement can change a lot of things. So curriculum is one thing, but you can go well beyond that. And I think this is a really productive space for you guys to start thinking through, uh, you know, the discipline of architecture as a generation. And I think, you know, there, there have been generations that preserved the status quo. But it seems like this generation is really re ready to destabilize it. And, and I think that's, that's, that's really exciting. If, if I could just add one thing to that, I think you can start coordinating to teach each other, you know, teach-ins. I think architecture students have the, the kind of skills and critical leanings to actually really be great in a kind of teach-in situation. And what may seem like the strength of architecture's, um, you know, kind of navel-gazing, at the level of the authority of the institution is also its weakness. So by that I mean, because every institution is so wrapped up in the same accreditation and the same canon, and then is so kind of just you know blinders around that, that can seem like a really like a like a tight thing to lock out of. But that's its weakness because it means that it is so poor at communicating with the rest of the world that when you get outside of that and you decide, oh, I'm just going to talk to other students who are also teaching themselves in whatever discipline, and I'm going to share the curriculum that we just came up with and the lessons plan and the workshops and our blogs and our TikTok, that will just break out of that, that stupid kind of myopic, you know, kind of clinch um, in a way that you'll be bigger than your host institution very quickly. you going to say something a second ago? Oh, okay, my mic. What was I going to say? Oh, no, I was going to I was, I was going to reinforce what Amanda said um, just on the ground level. I, number one, this generation has the internet, right? So <laughs> the ability to mobilize is so much more robust than what we faced. We were going to, we were card catalog generation, you know what I mean? So the idea of kind of moving beyond the sort of um, navel gazing aspect and really being so much more interdisciplinary is something that you have immediate access to. The fact that there's already documents that lay the groundwork for the kind of um, way you can begin to sort of, you know, affect the curriculum and show precedence that already works, right? So if there are institutions that are further ahead in having these conversations, just ask for their letters, ask for their information and say, you know, this is going on over here. So this isn't a function of, you know, this this isn't something that cannot be done. But um, 
outside of that, what we did that I think that Amanda really pointed out, which is which which I have seen when I've gone to um, you know various schools and and and, and kind of sat on reviews. Like Amanda said, we went to each other's reviews across. You know, Amanda was two years ahead of me. You know what I mean? And she was sitting there in my in my little <laughs> first year review. Sorry, three years ahead of me sitting there in my little first year review, you know what I mean? Like literally being there and, and kind of speaking up. So that level of community. And that's one thing that I've always said when I've uh, gone to, um, again, gone and sat on reviews and kind of spoken to students who felt uh, boxed out or, or, or felt the kind of, uh, you know, their personal cultural considerations weren't being acknowledged and considered effectively. What I noticed is, was that there was a lack of community, right? There was a like you gotta really work. Like we were, we were, we were working together. We were in the same room. We would come up, so we would go upstairs, see what the third year, fourth years. We 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 supported each other so much, you know, so much because the thing is, I don't know how architecture is right now, but at Cornell, it's the most isolating field that you can be in <laughs> if you are if. If, if you fall outside of being, you know, we don't go to the library that all of our, you know, outside of Amanda and Seku, none of my immediate, you know, my, I had a whole group of friends that none of them were architects. And all five years, they may have never set foot in the architecture studio, you know what I mean? So incredibly isolating program outside of where all your friends may be, when they go eat, you know what I mean? When they go to the library to study. So we really made a point to form a very strong community and I came into that community and within that community I didn't feel like I was doing anything radical but I did whatever I wanted to do you know what I mean and I had the support you know I had the support of of these students who would look out for what I was doing and I tried to make sure to do it very well you know what I mean um but Every project I did, I put a narrative that I was interested in, and they had to look at it <laughs> and consider it or not consider it. You know what I mean? And and uh, but again, really supporting each other in terms of actually being in studio together and giving each other crits outside of dismantling the institution itself, really uh, kind of diminishing the feeling of isolation you might feel in this program. You know what I mean? That a lot of us felt as architecture students um, doesn't have a large, you know, black enrollment or not, you know, didn't didn't have that large enrollment at that time. Um, so, I mean, I, I can't speak to that importance because I see that the work is much better outside of outside of changing the curriculum and outside of, you know, telling the stories you want to. I see the actual work is better. I always say architecture is a field that you can't go to the library and study and do it by yourself. You have to be looking at what your contemporaries are doing, working on how they're producing, how they're drawing, model making, how their research, documentation. You gotta look, you gotta stay on top of it and see what everyone else is doing. You know what I mean? And like in order to really, you know, be producing at the level of your peers and having this very kind of comfortable um, you know, you know, sort of movement group. You know, within the operate. Um, I know, yeah, like to me, Amanda made it sound real scary. Like, what are you afraid of? <laughs> so, I was, but if you have that community, it feels less like you're doing something that you may not graduate. You know what I mean? Because we're all kind of doing it. You know, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It's not a, <laughs> yeah. This conversation you know, not, where. <laughs> yeah, this part of the conversation we're having is 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 literally exactly why I wrote wrote my book, Hip Hop Architecture, right? Um, dropping April 22nd. Um, <laughs> uh, it's, it's exactly why, because it's really like, you're in that, that space, these, these architectural spaces and doing really amazing forward thinking work and people are sitting back saying, this isn't academic, this isn't intellectual. This has no basis in, 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 in reality. This is not architecture. And what they mean is it's not architecture coming through that white lens, right? And again, um, I, I'm sorry if I'm offending white professors by saying that, but um, you know, we, we needed this resource, this book, 
and all the other books written by Mario and um, Amanda's book is coming out this 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 month and and others on the panel where these are all these great resources that now now that we we done growed up and we are at a level where we're producing real work and we are now academics and not just students we're passing it down to the next generation and keep and creating resources for 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 you to go back and 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 say um uh, whenever you hear that that really ignorant bullshit about you know this is an intellectual or academic work you can say yeah it's i can cite this here and this is a major publication and this was vetted by you know peer it was going through all your academic peer review processes and it's intellectually sound so um it's a tool and a resource for all students from now going forward um and it was incredibly important for me to do that and um you know the 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 this is why the the disclaimer i started out with this disclaimer that says this book is not for you and if you are and the you <laughs> again metromicon minakala fall like if that you is something that you feel offended by that's the you that this book is not for it's for the people who need this as a resource that can cite all of these amazing um practitioners and 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 thinkers in this space yeah i just want to add a little uh, a little bit to what lake was saying about um and i guess amanda as well about building these communities within institutions and you know i i applied to go to georgia tech i didn't get accepted um so i went <laughs> instead to southern polytech which is 30 minutes away and you know like we had a strong black student population so state school like it was like i don't know 30 of us each year or something um and and i think there were like about five or six of us who became really really close friends and these are still my best friends to this day we all moved to new york together we all you know did the summer intro program at gsap together and and i think once you build that community that's the community that will move with you and travel with you in, in all of these uh different spaces Let's do one final uh, question from the Q&A before, um, and then Sharab will just close it up, because um, we're at like three minutes over time. But um, this one says, uh, what do you envision the future of architecture specifically within, within the context of making these changes? Is there any specific piece you imagine or type of building you wish to see changed in a certain manner? I'll just use this to just piggyback off the last question with some sense. I'm, I'm kind of secretly obsessed with, with computation, and I, I think we're on the horizon of a, a post-computation kind of suite of technologies. Um, you know, everything from quantum to kind of material logic. Um, and I, I don't know if we're going to see that, you know, in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, but um, I think that part of what we're asking is, is actually different than and, and bigger than in the built environment and i just want to make a plug as far as the last um kind of i think with all this these moving kind of anecdotes from architecture school and about community i just want to make a plug for the loners out there you know that um, I, I didn't go to architecture school undergrad and i was i was always like you know with like the the black groups undergrad i was always like a little too queer and then the queer groups i was like a little too this you know what i mean like so i was but so i think you know my my architecture community was books you know it was citations it was exhibits i was speaking at, at, at san francisco sfmo i lived in san francisco for a few years before i moved back to the east coast and i mean i'm so glad i got to see the the, the early diller scapidio work you know, just like blur building, just just blew me away, you know, things like that. So I think, you know, geek out, you know, because I think this question you're asking us about what the future is, but it's it's in it's in y'all, you know, in both the community and the solo geeking out and the group geeking out, it's 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 in you. Church. <laughs> <laughs> 